It's pretty rare when a sequel lives up to the hype of the original game. The expectation is to get something bigger and better that improves on everything the first game pulled off. Insomniac took a different route with Miles Morales. Instead of tearing down and rebuilding New York, instead of reinventing the combat system or swinging mechanics, they chose to build off of a rock-solid foundation. They chose to put out another game in the series after two years, rather than waiting for four or more. But make no mistake, Miles improves on the formula where it matters. Insomniac managed to craft an experience that in a lot of ways is more memorable than its predecessor. Here's my deep dive into Spider-Man Miles Morales, one of my favorite games of 2020. Before we dive in, I want you guys to know that I did receive a review code for Spider-Man Miles Morales. And while that fact is important to note, it does not affect my opinion of the game. I've played a lot of open world games this year. Ghost of Tsushima, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Cyberpunk 2077. I've come to realize that Miles Morales does open world just as good, if not better than a lot of these games for two key reasons. First off, this game understands its scope and its size. Open world games are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's a spectacle in and of itself. There's nothing quite like knowing you can go literally as far as the eye can see. But for me, as these games grow, it's getting harder for the content to justify the size. Am I really getting that much out of doing the same activities in different locations after 50 or more hours of gameplay? Miles gives you one location, New York, New York. It's defined, it's Manhattan. It doesn't rival some of the bigger, grand, huge open worlds we've seen this generation, and I say it's for the better. Miles is just as big as it needs to be. There's not a single location or a single piece of content that exists for the sake of lengthening the experience. Everything that exists has a handcrafted feel and a narrative connection to justify it being there. I wish more games were like Miles in this way, because the focus is clearly on the quality, it's not on the quantity. The other reason Insomniac nails open world is traversal. This city is vast and detailed, but what's more impressive to me is how fun it is to navigate. Going from point A to point B is actually engaging, it involves decision making, and most important of all, it allows for creativity. In so many open world games, traversal is a means to an end. It's ride your horse, drive your car, steer your ship. You've done these things hundreds of times in dozens of games for thousands of hours. Don't get me wrong, it's not always a bad thing for traversal to be more passive. A lot of games this year are so stunningly gorgeous that I enjoy the downtime that traveling offers between activities. It makes me slow down and really soak in the environment and the world design. Plus, a lot of these games give you sea shanties or stories to hear, maybe a radio station with great music or an original score made for the game. But all of these passive experiences pale in comparison for me. They get old really quickly. Web slinging is active and it's engaging. It provides moment to moment action and represents one of the most satisfying forms of open world traversal I've felt since, I don't know, maybe the older Assassin's Creed games. You could also throw the open world Arkham games in there too. No, it, it doesn't evolve much from Spider-Man PS4 because it didn't have to. Web zipping, point launching, wall running, spring recovery, hell, just running and jumping off of buildings. Every bit of this is satisfying to me. And no matter how many times I travel the same areas, there's so many variables that make it fresh and engaging. Plus, it makes you feel like Spider-Man. The most important part of the entire game is making you feel like Spider-Man. That's what web slinging does. If it wasn't already true for the last game, I think these two Spider-Man games present the gold standard for open world traversal. This is the bar for which I'm going to compare all other open world games to in terms of traversal. Similar to web swinging, combat functions mostly the same. You've got that Arkham style counter system with some fun gadgets mixed in too. It's also similar in that it allows for creativity, mixing and matching of a bunch of different tools to defeat enemies in flashy and unique ways. However, combat evolves more than it might seem, and it's thanks to Miles' bioelectricity. Instead of having one ultimate ability that you build towards, like Peter, 
Miles has a rotation of Venom powers that can be mixed and matched with gadgets and combos. The result is that you can create some incredibly satisfying and diverse combat, and it's important that it feels like I'm the one creating these combos, that they're not prescripted. Insomniac does an excellent job of pacing the progression of these powers too, gating them behind story missions. I always appreciate when a game shows me why my character can do a thing. Each time Miles is tested and pushed to his absolute limit, he develops a new power based on that situation. If he needed to disappear, he developed camouflage. If he really needed to get out of a situation in a pinch, he develops this massive venom burst. Let's go back to camouflage. Initially, I didn't love this mechanic because it felt like just a way to make stealth easier. But then I realized how I could use camo in the middle of combat, and it completely changed my perspective. Disappearing mid-fight becomes a way to set up huge combos and confuse my enemies. Also, if I'm getting hammered, it gets me out of a sticky situation. In the end, it's just another piece added to this combat puzzle that fits and makes sense. I also found myself appreciating how difficult this game is. Many enemies have direct counters to Miles' abilities. Roxxon can suppress his Venom powers and reveal him in camo. The Underground has a huge variety of enemy types which require a specific way of countering them. So I found that I couldn't just waltz into any enemy base and roll over enemies. There is a strategy and a hierarchy of priorities that is satisfying to navigate. After Spider-Man PS4, it was hard for me to imagine how Miles would improve combat without switching things up and, you know, making what was great different for the sake of variety. But this game manages to do just that. Miles is much more of an action game than most open worlds these days, but I found myself appreciating how it avoids certain pitfalls that so many other of these games fall into. For example, a big pet peeve of mine that I could have seen this game doing is grinding the fun to a halt with menus, skills, progression, number-based stats, looting. Miles does everything it can to keep you moving and progressing. It only ever asks you to stop to spend skill points or unlock upgrades. Yes, I know it sounds like I'm praising what Miles doesn't do, and I also know that this is identical to how Spider-Man PS4 does it, but I could have easily seen this sequel incorporate unnecessary RPG elements in the way that Youngblood did for Wolfenstein. Just for the sake of variety, Miles knows where its strengths are. It's in the moment-to-moment -moment action, and it doesn't forget this. I wanted to take a moment to talk about puzzle platforming. Early on, Miles realizes his webs conduct electricity. This allows him to complete circuits by shooting webs and connecting them to power up generators. Sometimes these also require moving objects or crawling through small spaces. There's not a ton of these puzzles in the game to where it becomes like a main feature, but I always appreciate light puzzling when it's done well and it makes sense within the narrative, which is exactly what I found here. It's one of those surprises where it's really polished and refined and you're like, oh, this is actually nice. It's time to dip into the story, and there will be no specific story spoilers in this section. Miles is a really good person, faced with some very real adversity. At the start of the game, he just moved into a new part of the city, he just lost a member of his family, and he stumbled upon newfound superhuman abilities that he doesn't quite understand. He doesn't truly know what his place is in this environment. Although Miles is Spider-Man, he's second in line there too because Peter got there first, and he's reminded of this constantly. But the thing is, you'd never hear Miles make a list of his troubles like I'm doing right now. He's just the most humble, kind, and genuine person possible. This is a familiar trope with superheroes, I realize that. The unassuming, faultless good guy. But Miles is so well written and so well acted, especially the performance capture, that I couldn't help but connect with him. A large part of that stems from his actions, the way he interacts with everyone around him. With Peter, who he treats as his mentor and guide, with Genki, his best friend and partner in crime, with his mom, who is the reason Miles is so loving and supportive himself, and with Finn, his childhood friend who gets wrapped up in some bad business. All of these relationships and more paint Miles as not just a superhero, but a superhuman being. He's the ideal person to take on the role of the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. He's every bit as worthy and, in a lot of ways, more interesting to me than Peter Parker. It'll be really fun to see how they move the series forward, whether they're going to make Miles and Peter equal protagonists or give them their own games like they've already done. 
Let's dive into story specifics. Peter Parker goes on vacation over Christmas and tasks Miles with filling in for him. As luck has it, an all-out war between two factions breaks out, between the power-hungry energy company, Roxxon, and the vigilante crime group, The Underground. On the surface, going in, this was just not a super compelling plot for me. Just more bad guys doing bad things. But within the first hour, I was hooked. Miles' motivation for saving the day is not just his duty as Spider-Man, but his love for his friends, family, and his community. The Tinkerer presents a much more compelling villain than your typical big bad. Same goes with the Prowler, who complicates matters further. I was shocked at how well Insomniac managed to weave all these moving parts together to tell a memorable and unique story that wasn't retreading old ground. So much of the storytelling works due to how amazing this game looks on my PS5. I mean, every single cutscene features performance motion capture, which is essential to selling this game's narrative beats and keeping me immersed. Speaking of, I think we need to talk about polish. I've seen one glitch appear twice in my game after 100%ing it. Enemies have been launched into objects and gotten stuck, but the solution was easy. All I had to do was venom punch and they died. I've also noticed texture pop in maybe once or twice. That is it. That's the extent of my glitch and bug list. No broken animations, no clunky physics, no crashes, no broken game saves, no frame dips, no inconsistency. Nothing. Miles has got to be one of the most polished and technically sound video games I've played in recent memory. And in a year when so many games have had a lot of issues for obvious reasons that I think are excusable in this world right now, Insomniac managed to keep their quality bar at the very top. The more games I play, the more I value a polished experience. It keeps me immersed. It keeps me in the fantasy of the world. I don't think you can really put a price on a game's ability to do this, especially when so many games fail here. Nine times out of 10, I'm just going to prefer a game that runs well and delivers a smooth experience over one that consistently takes me out of it. So, is Miles Morales a perfect video game? No, but it's damn near close for me. It's a game that kept me actively engaged with the most important parts, story, the combat, and the world, from the title screen to 100% completion. It presents unique ideas in ways that make sense for the series, and refines ones that were already solid. Few sequels, especially those smaller in scope, manage to do that. Plus, if length is an issue, there is a New Game Plus mode straight out of the box. And honestly, for my money, Miles is worth it, even if you plan to play through it only once. Which is why it's going to be one of the most memorable games of 2020 for me, and one of my absolute favorite. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'm working on something similar for Cyberpunk since I just finished the game, so stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed, and if you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and hit the bell to turn on live notifications so you don't miss a new video. Also, follow me on social media. On Twitter, I'm at JVOnYT, and Instagram, I'm JV.YT. If you want to chat more about similar open world games, join our community Discord server over at discord.gg slash JV on YT. We've got a great group of folks that love talking about these kinds of games. So links for everything I've mentioned are in the description below. Big thanks to my YouTube members, my ultra fans, Dave, Grass, Deadwalker, Bill, Cullen, Cam, and Jacob. Super fans, Kamal, Casey, Tipsy Sergey, and Tarl K. Fans, John, Matthew, Spyro, JVO, Level42, Tia, Joe, Allura, and Lil Man. And my supporters, Nos, Nightmare, Sung, VToxic, Taryn, Glenn, Adam, Blaze, Mr. Hollow, Quickness, Firkin, Abishek, and Shug for supporting the channel. If you want to support me further, click the join button below this video. In exchange for your support, you'll unlock custom badges and emotes to use in streams and in chat. Check the link in the description for more information. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.